And I'll go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Susanna McGowan. I'm based at Georgetown University. I'm very honored to introduce you to Dr. Sean Becerra, who is a professor of psychology at the University of Iowa with a particular research interest in cognition and visual attention and perception. He is here to share with us the Learning at Iowa framework that was piloted in 2021. So Learning at Iowa, again, was launched officially in 2022. It's a campus-wide learning framework aimed at transforming the culture of learning on campuses. And what I love about this from a, um, uh, this framework, um, as mentioned in an Inside Higher Ed article, is that the goal of this framework is a full-on culture change. And as um, Dr. Vercera was quoted in the in a Chronicle of Higher Education article, he wrote, he wrote, when you talk about learning, I think you can easily see how these skills transfer across not just courses, but also transfer from the university into a career. So really thinking about how our students, students learn not only is important to them as they begin their academic career, but their lifelong skills that were that this framework is aiming to develop. The Chronicle of Higher Education also reported this as, as a framework that is both revolutionary and obvious at the same time. Um, so we're very excited to learn more about this framework and I'll pass the mic to Dr. Sean Becerra. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Susanna. Yeah, I think um, revolutionary but obvious is maybe something that others say of my career generally. Some, I've, 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 I've got a reasonable number of citations and, and, and some of that is because we've done some of the right kinds of experiments. Um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us uh, at this session, uh, especially when I saw the, the schedule and, and noticed that we were in a parallel session with Randy Bass. So the, the fact that, that anyone showed up was, was uh, a win for me, I think. Um, I'm going to share my screen and uh, and then really just kind of launch in uh, to what uh, Susanna talked about, which is uh, the Learning at Iowa framework that we've been developing here on the University of Iowa campus uh, to try to provide uh, a campus-wide systematic framework to help increase students' academic success, really to help students understand how to learn more effectively. Um, so uh, in addition to uh, introducing myself, uh, which Suzanne also did, uh, uh, Professor in Psychological and Brain Sciences and Director of uh, this Learning at Iowa project, uh, our program manager, Anat Levtov, I want to uh, have a shout out to. She's on the uh, meeting with us and will be helping me handle uh, the, the chat and uh, other aspects of Zoom. So. Um, Anat will be here helping out and uh, sending links when appropriate uh, for anyone who wants additional information. Um, with that, I also wanted uh, to just start off maybe trying to be a little bit more interactive as, as much as we can in a, in a hybrid setting like this. And uh, just for, for my own sense, if, if not for everyone's, just uh, do a quick poll to see who's joining us, just to uh, have a sense of, of what everyone's role is on their campus. Uh, so we're gonna open up a poll and if you could just maybe share what your campus role is. Um, if you're there like many of us and, and in a group, um, feel free to share the, the, the typical membership of the group, the mode, whatever, whatever seems, seems to fit. Great. Yeah. So certainly seeing a lot of student success and um, and advising, which just given our title and and what we what we teased with, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we'll just give it a few more seconds. But uh, one of the things that uh, I'll mention uh, about the Learning at Iowa project. Um, uh, we are uh, a, a, a P3 funded initiative. So our campus. Um, basically leased our, our campus power plant and then used some of the funds from that uh, to then reinvest into campus 
uh, activities and, and opportunities that, that there just wasn't a budget for. Um, but in developing this, uh, one, one of the reasons that we were able to uh, attract some support for the project is because of uh, campus partners that, that we specifically uh, worked with to, to, to try to push this out across campus. And, and, and many of our uh, offices that, that deal with student success um, and advising um, and, and our Center for Teaching uh, are, are involved. So, uh, so you'll, you'll see some of their contributions and, and, and some of our interactions with them um, throughout. So uh, I'm going to continue on and um, really uh, start by talking about the, the equity piece, right? Which is which is why we're here uh, at the institute, um, but also uh, just how important the role of learning is in issues around equity. Um, for me, this was uh, a very personal because uh, I'm a I'm a first generation college graduate. Uh, I was also a Pell Grant recipient. And as I spent more time as a faculty member and sort of learned more about the way higher education worked, uh, I, I started to uh, learn more about and appreciate um, some of the equity issues that that I could have very well faced, but were were really oblivious to when I went to college. Uh, so, you know, the kinds of things that, that, that I learned, you know, well after the fact were centered on things like national graduation rates, right? And, and the opportunity gaps that are created there. Uh, you know, typical national statistics of graduation rates for Pell Grant recipients versus non-Pell Grant recipients. Um, and, and there being a gap just in, in, in that level of graduation attainment. Um, similarly, for first gen and continuing gen students for, uh, majority and minoritized students, uh, we see that these are, are really system-wide gaps. Um, as a faculty member, I also became very much aware and attuned to some of these gaps uh, just in, um, in, in my own undergraduate teaching. Uh, for a number of decades, I taught uh, introductory psychology, um, and, uh, and, and the more time I spent on campus thinking about student success issues, the more I was exposed to, you know, graphs like this that show the DFW rate, uh, the proportion of students earning a D or an F or withdrawing from courses uh, as a function of, of various demographics, right? Majority students versus first gen or underrepresented or Pell Grant recipients. And this particular graph is characteristic of this. These are averages of 25 different um, introductory classes that the University of Iowa and many of our peers sort of agree on for having a common benchmark. And, and of course, the main takeaway here is that, um, you know, Across a, a fairly long history, uh, there are fairly persistent gaps between majority students, uh, continuing generation students, and, and, and different demographics of students, such as first-gen Pell Grant or minoritized students. Um, so for all of this, as a cognitive psychologist, um, it, it made me think, what, what is the role of, of cognitive factors in this? In higher education and student success, we often talk a lot about non-cognitive factors that are clearly very important, sense of belonging, uh, connectedness. Uh, but I think there's also a role for cognitive factors as well. And that supporting student learning can support equity. And that's because many of the things that I'll talk about will be things that some students will either arrive at college understanding or knowing how to do, or they may learn while they're in college, but that's by no means true of every student. And, and so making assumptions about what students know about learning and how we help students learn um, is a place where we may, if we're not careful, may be perpetuating some of these, these equity gaps. With this idea uh, that supporting student learning uh, supports equity, uh, I want to do one, one, one last quick little uh, uh, sort of shout out in, in the poll just to get everyone's thoughts. Uh, and I'd be curious to hear 
what recommendations for learning do you give to students when they come and 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 ask uh, ask for help? Um, I'm 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 a little bit curious by this part of me wants to think that uh, maybe there's uh, uh, some data collection to be done here. Use your resources. <laughs> ah, there we go. That's that's one. That's a good one. Practice problems. Connections across material. Peer engagement. Go to class. Go to office hours. Self quizzes. Prepare and review and practice. Review your notes before you leave. Yeah, these are all these are all great. This is wonderful. So, so feel free to to continue adding a few. Um, um, what what I'm also curious about because we have a, a, a similar issue that arises with students, um, and you don't have to respond to this. It's more of food for thought and something that I'd like you to think about. But why these recommendations? Why are these things that come to mind when someone asks you what you talk to students about or that you actually mention to students? And do they work? Are they, are they recommendations that you have high confidence in and, and high confidence in that they'll actually be useful to students and help them improve their learning and success in their classes? Um, the reason that I that I sort of raise these these last couple of questions is because of an issue that comes up when we talk to students about their own learning. Um, and we can ask a similar question. What do students know about their learning and their own learning practices? And people have have studied this and and systematically asked students in large introductory classes, why do they study the way that they do? Um, in fact, uh, you know this this very question. You know, do you study the way that you do because someone taught you uh, to study that way? Uh, was the 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 one uh, citation that I give of this was was asking this of uh, uh, almost five hundred introductory UCLA psychology students who were in their first semester, and the overwhelming response from those students was that no one had taught them how to study, right? That, that they just kind of figured it out on their own. Um, and, and, you know, these, these are interesting data, but they're by no means idiosyncratic to this particular sample at, at that particular university. I ask a, a version of this question to uh, students that I teach in, a, in an online learning about learning course. And every semester, uh, you know, I'll have upwards of 300 students. And, and again, overwhelmingly, the, the answer is, is that students don't study the way they do because they've been taught. They, they've just figured things out, which again, raises this as, as a potential source of, of an opportunity gap. Some students will figure it out, others won't. And, and then the question has to become who's figuring it out and, and why? And so it's really with this as background context that led uh, to the Learning at Iowa project. Uh, as I've already uh, talked about, as Susanna mentioned in the introduction, uh, Learning at Iowa is a campus-wide initiative. It's really aimed at those cognitive factors. What can students do to support their own learning? Some of this grew out of uh, this course that I just mentioned that I've taught regularly for a number of years now, a learning about learning course. Um, and trying to take evidence-based practices from my discipline and put them into a context that students can use and, and use in ways that should be beneficial to them. One of the things that I want to say at the outset, and one of the things that you'll see through the rest of the presentation, though, is that teaching students and, and helping students understand what some of these practices are is not enough in and of itself. Uh, we have to have campus buy-in. We have to have a campus environment that supports these same kinds of practices. And so one of the things that we've been spending most of our time with in the Learning of Iowa project is developing active collaborations with different academic departments and different student-facing offices to try to have uh, the, the same kind of content interleaved with the work being done in 
courses in uh, student facing offices. And so the goals of this approach are really to develop a common language for us to discuss learning and learning practices on campus and to develop, to develop materials and resources that can be used by all of our different audiences, student facing audiences, uh, the students themselves and instructors. And again, with the hope that this increases the equity of, of the, the work that's being done on our campus. With learning at Iowa, um, you know, a number of our uh, partners are listed here. We have slightly different content for the different uh, audiences that we have. So with instructors and faculty, we've got uh, a faculty learning community that is uh, developed with our Center for Teaching as a partner, where we have instructors who are interested in learning how to put cognitive learning supports into uh, their courses. We have a number of presentations to, um, to departments and uh, to faculty instructors. We're also coordinating TA training. Um, for student-facing staff, um, much of that is, is has been in partnership with our academic advisor and uh, career center coaches. And then we have a number of touch points for students, um, starting from really almost the first time they step foot on campus to get some of our content out in front of them to help them start thinking about learning in a much more intentional manner. Uh, um, highlight a couple of those uh, early student points and then talk a little bit about what, what our approach looks like. But I think one of the things that we've done to try to make this material accessible to this, this wide array of audiences is to, is to simplify what you know, could really be a very extensive literature from, from the cognitive sciences and the learning sciences about what works for learning. And what we've done is, is tried to condense this into what we call the three M's for effective learning. And those three M's are mindset, metacognition, and memory. And as I talk to audiences about this approach, I, I, I mentioned that, that these were not chosen randomly and that, that I don't talk about them in, in a random order because there's a logical progression for a learner sort of through these, through these, these three M's that a learner first needs to develop a growth mindset about their learning so that they know that they actually can learn and they don't shut themselves down uh, or, or self-handicap, uh, particularly when material gets too difficult or when the pace of, of, the, of, of a course becomes too fast. Once students understand this idea of a growth mindset and, and what they as a learner need to bring to, to a learning situation. We can then talk about metacognition and how effective learning is going to be something that you have to monitor, you have to reflect on so that you can track and understand when you've learned something, when you understand it, but also when you may need to reach out for help. And then once you can monitor your own learning, we need to then talk about our third M memory, what actually works for the learning process and contrast that with what maybe feels like it works, but, but probably doesn't for a number of reasons. And so the three M's gives us, you know, it gives us a little bit of alliteration. It, you know, I like to joke that, you know, it gives us three items to remember, and that's well within our working memory capacity. But again, it gives us a common touch point for all of the audiences that, that, we're, that we're having these conversations with. One of the, the we, we've got a few places that I mentioned where students will start hearing about the three M's and about learning at Iowa, again, almost immediately when they step on campus. Um, and I just want to highlight a few of those before I then go through the three M's, talk about how we discuss those with, with groups and how different groups are actually using each of those in, in, in their particular settings. So for these campus-wide touch points, uh, probably one of the first ones that we get is our fall semester orientation that students start the Friday before fall semester courses begin. Uh, this is called On Iowa, and one of the, the, the common events at On Iowa for students is, is what's called the Excel lecture, which is a, a short lecture that's delivered by uh, campus instructors and faculty. These are people who uh, often teach large enrollment courses, 
And, and they're chosen in particular because many of the students who are, are listening to this Excel lecture will actually be in classes taught by these instructors. Um, of course, these are also instructors that, that have uh, a personal interest in, in student success. But one of the things that happens in the Excel lecture, you know, one of the broad themes is what are the expectations of the courses that you will be in, trying to help students transition from high school into university level thinking. Uh, and as part of that, we have an introduction to learning at Iowa that includes a short video that introduces the three M's that talks about how each of them can connect with uh, connect with students learning in their courses and, and then provide some, uh, just, just a few touch points to say, you know, here are some things that you should really be thinking about while you're, you're starting classes and, and engaging with the content of those classes. Uh, many instructors also include as part of this uh, a demonstration to try to drive the point home to students that, that, their, that their memory isn't quite as effective as they think it is. Uh, so we do a quick little memory demonstration in a few of these uh, sessions uh, to, to try to show students that what they think about learning um, may not be sort of what we would consider sort of empirically demonstrated best practices. Um, just a few short weeks after that Excel lecture where students have heard this, um, students are also uh, enrolled in a course called Excelling at Iowa that's an online asynchronous course. That's really an onboarding course for new students. It covers all of university-wide information that you would expect it to, everything from campus libraries to the campus bus system. Uh, but one of the things that, that we just started this past fall semester was a Learning at Iowa module that includes uh, several short videos that introduce each of the three M's to students, along with a number of, of sort of direct recommendations for how to use this content in their courses. Um, there are a few comprehension questions asked along the way just to make sure that students aren't clicking through this. Um, but this lands at a particular time in the semester that's particularly useful because it's still early on enough that students are, uh, you know, maybe having that first low stakes assessment where they, they are starting to think about, you know, how well are they doing? Are they really engaging with the courses? But still before that first round of midterms. And these, uh, the, the videos that appear in these modules are also um, uh, available to students and others on campus after uh, after the, the Excelling at Iowa course is closed uh, so that instructors can embed these in their course content or bring these videos back up at relevant points, you know, before or after an exam uh, to talk about what students may or may not be doing uh, to, to succeed in their courses. Last campus-wide touch point that I want to mention just really briefly uh, is a partnership that we have with our Division of Student Life and with Residence Education, which has been uh, to put together a, a 3M's bulletin board that, that happened for the first time uh, this past February. So we had content in all of the residence halls that that introduced, reintroduced learning at Iowa to students uh, and the three M's, but also made some specific recommendations for what students can be doing uh, around their, their studying and, and learning. Um, we haven't just sort of kept this as a one-off just with sort of passive programming. Uh, before this appeared, we had a presentation to all of the resident assistants, the, the RAs that were in the residence halls, to not only let them know that this was coming, but also to give them some, some additional touch points and information that they could use uh, when they heard from their residents about you know, how their classes were going, if, if things weren't going well, or uh, just, just anything around learning. Uh, the, the last piece that, uh, that we're getting put into to place with our resident education partners uh, are some talking points for Hawk Talks, which are these one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings that each resident assistant will have with each of his or her um, residents to talk about various issues around the transition to college and, and, and how things are going. Uh, one of those Hawk Talks is specifically built and structured around uh, academics and academic success, 
And this gives us sort of a natural place to raise learning at Iowa, some of our content and, and uh, some of the recommendations that, that, we, uh, that we make from our three Ms. So we've got a lot of good contact with students on this front. Um, I think what's important here though, is that, right, as a psychologist, I know that we can talk a lot and we can introduce these concepts a lot. Knowing something is very different from using something. And so this gets us to this point of how do we then take this and, and take this learning at Iowa content into, in, into the environment of campus so that students are not just hearing about it, but they're also using it in meaningful ways in different situations. And so what I'd like to do is, is sort of share how we talk about and frame each of our M's and give you some examples of how that's being used in different settings. So I'll jump right into mindset. I suspect this for this audience, many of you have probably heard about the, the, the concept of mindset, in particular, this idea of a growth mindset about intelligence. Much of this comes from the work of a Stanford psychologist named Carol Dweck and, and really boils down to sort of how you, how you respond to a question like this, how no matter how much intelligence you have, you can always change it a bit. Uh, right? Stand, this is a standard uh, mindset assessment. If you tend to strongly disagree with this statement, you tend to have uh, more of a fixed mindset. If you strong, strongly agree with this statement, you have more of a growth mindset about intelligence and skills. And so what Dweck tells us is that we can put intelligent, your, your beliefs or your mindset about intelligent skills on this continuum from this fixed anchor point that basically views intelligence and skills and learning as unchangeable, right? You've, you've, you've got a certain amount in, of intelligence or you have a certain amount of capacity to learn and that's, that's what you have. Uh, if you've ever heard students you know, tell you that they're not a math person or you know, that they're not good at languages, you know, whatever the context is, that's, that's an endorsement of a fixed mindset. Um, but equally uh, an endorsement is, is the student who tries to downplay um, the, the possible amount of work that they have to do to be successful. So by downplaying and saying, I don't even have to try, uh, it may, may uh, make someone uh, sort of believe that, that you know, they, they have uh, intelligence and skills to be able to succeed uh, and, and, and then also endorse the possible belief that others don't. Um, what we really want are learners to have uh, a growth mindset, uh, which is the idea that intelligence and learning are things that can grow and improve if you do the right kinds of things. And we, we really need to point out, um, in, in part because some of this mindset language has made its way down into high school and even junior high settings, um, sometimes that, that message and these practices get a little miscommunicated. Um, this idea of a growth mindset is not just thinking positively about things, right? This is not just magical thinking, just hope for the best and everything will turn out. Um, really what we need to think about with growth mindset is, is the role that effort plays in that and the role of deliberate practice. You can grow your learning, right? You can learn, but you need to engage in it and you need to engage in the right kinds of practices. That's the deliberate practice. Um, this mindset message, sort of talking about growth mindset and, and giving various audiences tools sort of shows up in a couple of really nice audiences where we talk about this. So one is the student audience, right? How do we message a growth mindset to students and how can we promote this in, in ways that should be impactful for students? I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Um, one of our campus partners uh, is uh, our college algebra course, which like on most campuses uh, is, is a large course. It's, uh, it's remedial in that if, if students haven't placed outside of college algebra and they're in a STEM field, uh, they're, they're gonna have some, some challenges ahead of them just in terms of getting through the, the, the math and quantitative reasoning courses that they need to have. Um, in order to work on the, the success of students in college algebra, uh, the instructor that we've partnered with uh, has a reflective discussion early in the semester about doing hard things that 
promotes this growth mindset. Ask students to talk about how they've learned hard things in the past, whether that's uh, for a sport that they've played or a musical instrument, and get students to self-generate that learning something hard for them in the past has required effort and practice. Um, and this also then raises the, the opens, opens up sort of the conversation to being able to discuss strategies for what's going to happen when challenges arise, right? When you get to the point where you don't understand something that we're doing in class, what are you then going to do? And again, using this as a way of getting students to self-generate, reaching out for help, going to office hours, whatever that, whatever that help might be. Uh, another quick touch point where we have uh, that we have on this on campus is is the learning about learning course that I teach, where we actually use a growth mindset intervention that's that's exactly the same that uh, Dweck and colleagues have used to talk about neuroplasticity, and to use just learning something about neuroplasticity really as a carrier for growth mindset beliefs. If you understand that your brain changes when you practice and you learn, then the idea is, is that you realize that it's that practice and effort that, that produces the learning and you're more likely to then engage in it and adjust with, with sort of proactive responses when you have questions or, or when, you, when you need help. One of the important things uh, about mindset, though, is that uh, we, we also have uh, mindset content for, for faculty and instructor audiences. Much of the work around mindset over the past several years uh, has deviated where this, this work has been tended to, to live, which is typically targeted learners. Can you get students to be more successful if you help them develop a growth mindset? It turns out that there are implications for instructors around growth mindsets. Instructors, like, like any learner, can have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset about learning. And it turns out that the mindset that an instructor has will change the, the, the tenor and the quality of the course and can affect students' outcome in any number of ways. But we know that uh, instructors who have more of a fixed mindset belief give students different feedback than instructors who have growth mindset beliefs. An instructor's beliefs can actually change the gender gap that we see in STEM classes, and it can also achieve. Uh, it can also uh, affect racial achievement gaps in in introductory STEM classes. There's some some beautiful work from uh, Mary Murphy, Elizabeth Canning, and their colleagues, who show that STEM faculty who have a fixed mindset, who believe that you kind of have a fixed amount of of intelligence, actually have larger gaps in performance, which here is given by the STEM course grade between majority and minoritized students than instructors who have a growth mindset. So having a growth mindset as an instructor is, is, is a, a positive benefit for students. Students are more likely to engage with the course and engage in help seeking. Um, and, and so providing some of this content to instructors helping them understand not only what it means to have a growth mindset, but giving them some language for discussing a growth mindset um, and maybe pivoting their class. And instead of talking about it as a weed out class, how they can talk about it in terms of student learning and student success has a net positive benefit for students. Again, around our three Ms, once students or really anyone understands that they can learn because they've adapted uh, and adopted this growth mindset, um, we then need to get to the point where we can understand how to regulate and monitor our own thinking. And so that takes us to our second M around metacognition. Um, of course, many of you have probably heard about metacognition as thinking about thinking. Uh, there, there's some really interesting nuance around metacognition actually having two different components. One component is your knowledge of cognition. What do you know? What do you know that you don't know? Uh, one fun example that you know, we like to use with students is just ask for a show of hands, how many of them know who Lizzo is, right? All the hands go up. Um, you know, we can even poke them a little bit further and ask who's her favorite Chris. Most of them know who her favorite Chris is, but you ask them something like, who's the 25th president of the United States, right? It's crickets, no hands go up. And it just sort of makes the point that you can 
you have knowledge of what you know. You can monitor your own knowledge and your own understanding and thinking. So that's an important piece of being able to learn effectively. But the other important piece is being able to regulate your cognition while you're while you're using cognition to perform some task, right? While you're while you're thinking about and working on a problem set or while you're preparing for an exam or some other assessment, how do you regulate that learning and cognition that needs to happen in that? And it's around regulation that we try to give students a, a very, very concise framework for thinking about how to reflect and direct or control their thinking and learning. And there are a lot of different schemes for thinking about metacognitive regulation. One that we use because it's very straightforward and maps nicely on to what students have to engage in when we ask them to, to do all of the tasks that we ask them to do, uh, involve three metacognitive processes, planning, monitoring, and evaluating. And, and each of these is tied to sort of work on a particular task, right? Metacognitive planning involves before you jump into that problem set or that assigned reading, right? What is it that you're being asked to do? What strategies or approach do you need to take? Um, and planning also involves just a certain amount of time management. How much time is it going to take me to read this 45 page chapter? Once students have done the planning, when they're actually engaged in the process, they need to have an in the moment awareness of how they're doing uh, so that they can catch misunderstandings when they arise or they can catch you know, the, 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 the metacognitive sort of mistakes that we've all made where we get to the bottom of a page that we're reading and realize that our mind wandered and we have no idea what we just read even though our eyes were clearly moving left to right and up and down on the page. And then once students have gone through a task, right? They really need to close this metacognitive loop by evaluating and appraising how things went, right? Did they learn what they needed to do? Did they give themselves enough time? Um, and, and then they need to take their results from that evaluating phase and cycle it back into planning because it's only with that sort of complete closing the loop will students then be able to make adjustments for things that may not have gone as well as they would have liked, uh, whether that's based on the time, based on whether that's an, on the understanding of what they were being asked to do in an assignment. So students resonate with this. They understand how you can sort of take any, any task and sort of break it down into these stages. Um, and, and then the question is, right, how do, we, how do we guide students on this? And how do we put this into practice in places where students are using it meaningfully in, in, in various places on campus? So we do a few things uh, with student audiences to, to make planning, monitoring, and evaluating a little more specific and, and uh, a little more usable. So we've curated uh, from the metacognition literature a number of questions that students really should be asking themselves as they are either getting ready to work on a task or they're working on it uh, that help them really stop and be very intentional with themselves about their planning, their planning, monitoring, and evaluating. Um, again, these are questions that are, that are useful to students. Um, Oftentimes, though, what, what's maybe more important is getting students to use these in a way so that it's not just, yeah, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Um, and so one of the other things that we have uh, with metacognition, uh, sort of targeting our student audiences, uh, is, is to have these kinds of questions embedded in places where students are working with others so that we can reinforce these metacognitive uh, messages. So peer tutoring um, and learning assistance on campus will often hear about learning at Iowa and our 3Ms, but will also get specific ways of interacting with their students to help students promote their own metacognitive uh, reflection. Uh, so one place that we do this with our academic support and retention partners is through the training of supplemental instruction leaders. Um, these leaders are, are supports for many of our large enrollment courses that where we know we're getting a lot of students and we know that these are our courses that many students struggle with in their transition uh, to college. And again, it just helps us reinforce our messages about the 3Ms, but also gives students specific activities 
and in and, and a specific context to, to have to think about what they're doing and how they're learning. Uh, our Center for Language and Culture Learning uh, has uh, peer tutors who help in language learning, and they're using a number of these uh, metacognitive prompts, again, to get students to be more reflective in their learning, and in, in many cases, to be more proactive about how they're engaging with their learning. The other way that we've seen metacognition and, and particularly prompts around planning, monitoring, and evaluating used is in specific assignments in courses that encourage students to reflect on their metacognition for the content of that class. So it takes the 3M content, it takes metacognition in particular, but it requires students to use it in a course and, and use it in a way that, that it, it's a little harder for students to get away from it, you know, if, uh, if, as opposed to just hearing about it. Uh, so we have uh, a number of courses that we're partnering with. Uh, we have a large general education course uh, called Inequality in American Sport that uses reflection in metacognitive journals at various touch points throughout the semester to not only get students to think about their learning the course content, but to think about how they're learning and approaching that content more generally. Uh, our college algebra course is also doing this. So not just with the doing hard things uh, example that I gave for uh, around mindset, but also having students reflect on what are they doing to prepare for exams? How did exams go? Engaging in the planning, monitoring, and evaluating uh, in, in, in this particular context. Uh, and then, of course, my learning about learning class uh, uses this as really the main assessment where students keep a metacognitive journal, not for my class, but for every other class that they're taking. And, and they're actually directed to be very intentional and reflective on, on the work that they're doing and, and do this. Uh, for six of the eight weeks that they're taking learning about learning. So it provides, um, really the way I like to talk about it is it provides a nudge for students not to just think that metacognition is a good thing, but to actually put it into practice. We also have a number of courses using exam wrappers, um, which is a, a, it can be a pre or a post exam or assignment uh, assignment, it's, a, it's an assignment about the assignment uh, that asks students to reflect on how the assignment went or what they're doing to prepare for it. Uh, and and um, there's a, a, a research literature around uh, exam wrappers that suggests that, that, that they work effectively, especially if they're used in, in uh, several courses. Uh, it really just gives students a way of having to in, engage in that metacognitive evaluation in a very pointed manner and evaluate uh, how an exam went. What were the errors that they made? Where did they do well? Uh, and, and what else do they need you know, to be doing maybe uh, for the next assessment that comes up? And it, it gives us a way of, of sort of encouraging students to engage in this reflection around their learning. Um, we have a number of courses that use these exam wrappers. Our introductory psychology course uses these. Uh, they're also being used uh, in um, uh, our uh, college algebra and in the uh, American studies, the inequity in American sport course, uh, as, well as, as well as others. This idea of exam wrappers also has, we've, we've used this as a way of, of giving um, a staff audience across campus a way of having a nice conversation starter uh, with um, students that they're working with. Um, and so we've developed uh, what we call semester wrappers uh, that can be given sort of mid-semester or, or at the end of the semester as a way of having, uh, a, having students do a little bit of structured reflection that they can then use in advising meetings to, to then have some, you know, some specific discussion around what are you doing in your classes? How is it working? And then that opens the conversation up for advisors and others to remind students about the three M's or introduce the three M's and make some of the recommendations that, uh, that, that we've been able to provide uh, our advisors and, and others. So with metacognition, the last M that we have that, that I'll talk about quickly uh, and, and then maybe leave some time for some open discussion or for fielding questions uh, is, is on memory. 
Um, but before we jump into that, I've been talking for a while and want to give myself a break to get some water. But more importantly, um, I, I see the chat has been active, but I actually want to ask a, uh, a pointed question just to see if you get the same kinds of responses from students that I get about how students prepare for an exam or a quiz or you know, many of the things that we ask them to do. So I'd be curious if you could offer maybe what the most common approach is that you've heard from students. If you ask them, you know, what did you do to get ready for your exam? Uh, yeah. Studied my notes, reread, I see. Oh, yeah, study material the night before. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah, read notes, practice exam, practice exam and Quizlet are good. Um, good sleep is important. It's one of those non cognitive factors that turns out to actually have some really important implications for cognition. Um, Okay, so Susanna's is like the, the 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 gold standard student, right? To actually schedule it in, which which is impressive. Um, my my answers that I get to from students on this is is really sort of what I'm what I'm seeing here is you know reviewing notes often the night before. Uh, students will often say, "Go through my notes." They're usually not as pointed as saying rereading my notes. Occasionally, I'll get a student who says rewriting my notes, um, which seems a little more active than rereading notes, but 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 I, I suspect that that's not the case. Um, so it's 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 pretty. I, I think it's almost a universal what students do um, uh, around sort of reviewing notes and rereading notes. Uh, and, and it's probably not the best thing that students can do. What we try to do is to give students some additional strategies for this. Um, but one thing that I wanna mention about our third M about memory is, is that it's, it's clearly central to learning. But one of the things that I think is important to note here is that it's not memorization. There's an important difference uh, between memorization and between what we're talking about when we talk about memory. What we really want to talk about is how, how learning works and how do you get information uh, not only into memory to build sort of your database of knowledge, but also sort of maintain it there um, so that you don't forget it, you know, 20 minutes after the exam. Um, and I've, I've, got a, I've got a little demonstration to sort of highlight how memory is not memorization. Um, maybe uh, if you just either in the, uh, probably not in the chat, I'll just maybe do like a thumbs up or something. Uh, I'll ask, ask you to engage in a little metacognition and uh, just give a thumbs up if, if you or your group uh, knows what a penny looks like. Do you know what a penny looks like? The, the coin a penny. One cent. I, I see mostly thumbs, right? Because if you've lived in the US, I mean, I, I know we're not using, you know, money much as opposed to plastic, but for this group, I'm guessing people probably think they know what a penny looks like. Um, and anytime a psychologist asks you a question like that, you should be suspect um, because now I'm going to ask you uh, to tell me which one the penny is, highlighting the fact that really what memory is, is it's the residue of thought. And so you may have a memory of a penny, right? But that memory of the penny might be limited. So now you can put in the chat the letter of which one the actual penny is. Um, does anybody know without actually pulling out a penny if you happen to have one? <laughs> Well, usually the answers are all over the place. <laughs> no, oh, oh, summer illustrations. Yeah, that's maybe a little too much metacognition. 
Uh, yeah, I see. So, okay, a couple of Ds, I, J. Yeah, I see they're, they're all over the place. So, so the, the first one, uh, first one was actually right. It's actually A. Um, and I, I regularly verify this just to make sure that I remember, well, I know what a penny looks like. Uh, so A is the penny. So what's the point here? Well, it's, it's that, that quote from Dan Willingham that memory is the residue of thought, right? You do have a memory for what a penny looks like, but that memory is probably very vague, right? You know it's the coin-shaped thing that's a particular color and a particular size. And so you've got a lot of familiarity with pennies. And so it feels like you know maybe more about the penny than you actually do, which is the whole point of the, the figure on the slides, is that your memory for a penny is very coarse, in part because you've never really had to think about a penny. The person who could probably pick the penny out of this lineup is you know, someone who's been collecting coins for a number of years and who actually has engaged in that level of thinking about, about a penny. And this highlights something important about memory not being memorization, right? If, if you just try to memorize, you're going to generally have a very superficial memory for things. The other piece, though, is that those things that we saw in the chat that students are most likely to engage in, like rereading notes or maybe even recopying notes, is kind of at the level of sort of knowing what a penny looks like in that it's round and it's the one that's colored differently from all of the others. There's a lot of fluency or familiarity with the penny, but not a lot of the detail. And of course, the kinds of assessments that we do, what we're asking students to do is not just be able to recognize something when they can see it, but understand the details and you know, effectively pick the penny out of the crowd. What you need to do to be able to have memories that aren't just reliant on familiarity, right? You've got to get away from the highlighting and the rereading. Those things are not bad in and of themselves, but for good durable memories, students need to be engaged with more active memory practices. Um, the problem with this is, and this brings in a little metacognition, is that those things that are the most effective for your memory feel hard. And not only do they feel hard, they also feel like you're not learning as much. And so if you don't stop and see how well they work, you're going to think, well, this isn't working and it feels hard. So why should I do it? And you go back to rereading your notes or copying your notes. Kinds of things that we need students to do, cognitive scientists call desirable difficulties. Um, they're difficulties because they're hard. They may take longer than just rereading your notes, but they're desirable because they lead to more durable learning and they, they lead to more longer lasting learning. These are things that, that students, you know, if they engage with these, they'll be less likely to forget material over time. There are a number of different things the cognitive scientists sort of have empirically validated as being these kinds of desirable difficulties. With learning at Iowa, we talk about two that map really nicely onto the kinds of things that most students are doing. We'll talk about spaced and interleaved practice with, uh, with various audiences, and we'll talk about retrieval practice. And both of these are, are a little bit like they sound. So spaced and interleaved practice, really what spaced practice is, is it's, it's the opposite of cramming. Um, sometimes students know that they shouldn't cram, but they end up cramming anyway. Um, some of that's because they're not really engaged with the metacognitive planning that you need to do to space your practice out. Um, but with spaced practice, you know, you can, you can engage with material the same way for the same amount of time, but when it's spaced out over different sessions and sessions ideally spaced by at least a day, um, a final test on the material that you've uh, you've reviewed will, will almost inevitably be better. Your, your memories will be better with the spaced practice than with the massed practice. Um, interleaving is a similar concept that we introduce to students in terms of when they you know, when they're when they're doing their study sessions at night. Um, there's actually benefit to intermixing the topics that they're reviewing. So, you know, maybe do some calculus problems for an hour, uh, take a short break and then mix it up a little bit and, and uh, you know, read that uh, intro psych chapter or whatever that is. Um, 
both of these work because you actually allow a little bit of forgetting in between sessions, either in between sessions that you've interleaved or in between sessions that you've spaced out. And a little bit of forgetting followed by a relearning actually makes the, the relearning of the material more durable and, and, uh, and, and less likely to be forgotten. Um, of course, what you have to do with this with students is, is also weave in the fact that you've got to have your metacognition in place to be able to, to just organize yourself to be able to do the spaced practice. Um, the other uh, desirable difficulty that we talk about regularly is retrieval practice, which is, a, which is like it sounds. It's that there is a benefit to memories for actually having to go in and retrieve or recall those memories. Um, so sort of the classic version of, of, a, of a retrieval practice study is if you give one group of students an opportunity to study the material twice and then take a final test. And you compare that final test performance to a group of students who studies the material and then takes a quiz on the material without any feedback, and then they take a final test and a final test that's different than the quiz that they took. The group that had to recall the material has a better memory to the group that actually studied the material twice. So simply rereading or re-engaging with material in a relatively shallow way multiple times uh, actually doesn't, doesn't help learning uh, be, become sort of stronger or more permanent. Uh, forcing yourself to actually retrieve the information is, is, is kind of uh, very critical to the learning process. Um, and it also has the added benefit of this is sort of the metacognitive evaluation in practice. How do you know how well learning went uh, when, you, when you had to learn something? Well, if you can recall it and answer a question about it or explain it to someone else, then, then it went well. And if you can't do those things, then you know that you may need to revisit that material or use your growth mindset to then go to office hours to get a question answered. Um, we've got a, a, a number of, of, of ways that we target this uh, content across, uh, across our campus. Um, it's certainly most relevant for students, uh, but we also talk to instructors about this because we, we have a number of instructors who will hear about best practices and hear about, uh, you know, low stakes assessments and why they should be using those. And, and this gives us some content and, and a nice touch point for why we do these things, right? Low stakes assessments are nice because you can have students, you build into your course, the retrieval practice, have them take quizzes every week and maybe just get credit for the attempt because actually going through the quiz will help students strengthen the memories that they have and give them a, a point of knowing what they may actually need to spend a little bit more time reviewing on. So that's a little bit of a whirlwind tour of our 3Ms and how we use it in various places on our campus. Um, a couple of just really quick closing points. Uh, I, I wanna sort of reiterate something that I, I said at a couple of points that this is not all, this learning that I was content is not all just put on to students. The learning environment matters, and that's why it's really important for us to have touch points across campus. Uh, we'd like to see this used in even more courses than it's already being used in. Um, as far as the implementation goes, one thing that we've heard about this is, uh, you know, how how can I use this? I think one thing that's important for the way that we've approached this is that. Consistent messaging is important um, so that we can get away from the, if a student has a question and they ask five different people, they're not getting 10 different answers. Um, and so we can try to encourage students to, to engage in, in these, these good practices by having consistent messaging. Now, having said that, we, we realize that that not not every campus uh, will will be able to do this. I mean, we we haven't we haven't even tapped all of the possibilities on our campus. Um, but at least some of these supports are beneficial if you can get students to engage in uh, spaced practice, uh, or if you can introduce them to metacognition, even in individual courses or individual uh, meetings that you might be having with them. There's some advantage over over not doing anything and letting students simply try to figure out these things on their own. 
And so I guess the, the last thing to end with here is, is maybe just open up the last uh, few minutes that we have uh, for any questions or comments that you may have. I know that uh, Anat has been uh, wonderfully busy in, in the chat. Um, if there's anything that you'd like to ask, uh, feel free to drop it in uh, or unmute if that's a possibility. Uh, we'd be curious to know um, what you found useful, how you think you might uh, be able to use this or none of the above. So thank you very much. I appreciate the, the time and the opportunity. Thanks so much, Sean. We're getting a lot of questions from University of Illinois. I don't know if they're able to unmute because I know that you're all in the same room, but if but I'm happy uh, so, to. So question about wrappers yeah. getting used within advising session. Um, so. Um, in terms of getting advisors on board, and and Anat, I Anat really took the lead on this um, because she's been working with uh, our engineering advisors. Um, some of that was was actually just outreach from the advisors themselves. They they knew about and had heard about the Learning at Iowa project, wanted to talk about how they might be able to use it in their work, specifically around advising meetings that they were having with students who are on academic probation, and it was out of those conversations. Uh, that are not really took this idea of, of an exam wrapper and said, well, let's let's use this as a structured tool to have an advising conversation. And I think one thing that was important with that was that the advisors were involved in the creation of that document. So so they they contributed to what was going to be helpful for them. Anything else that that uh, we could answer? Anything else that anyone would like to share? Sean, I'm curious, this is Susanna again. I'm curious about uh, what sort of evaluation you've done on the framework and if you have any, um, what are you learning from students about their learning about learning? That's a great question. Um, I, I think I think assessment has has been one of the things that has stymied me the most, um, but only because I, I, I carry I carry some baggage from my disciplinary background. Um, I've, I've I've had to rethink the way that I think of assessment. Um, I think where we see a lot of the most useful feedback from students is what they say about the content that's actually being woven into their courses. Uh, and much of this is in, in some of the metacognitive journals that they write in those courses. Um, some of these courses also have um, uh, an end of semester assignment, like a letter to a future student that asks students to uh, also reflect on, you know, sort of what did you get out of the class, not only content wise, but also process wise. And, um, for, for many of the, the courses that we work with, right, what students are saying is, is that it, it's been extraordinarily useful for them to have to engage with material in this much more meaningful way and, and be kind of held to that by, by, by the course or by the instructor. Um, you know, I know one, one of the, the places that I see this is in my learning about learning course where students have to keep this metacognitive journal. Um, I ask them specifically at the end of the class, what did you find useful from the course? And one of the major themes is, I mean, first of all, um, students overwhelmingly tend to report that they found the class beneficial and, and often say things like, wow, I wish I would have found this before, you know, the first semester of my senior year. Uh, they'll also share that they think that this is something that every student at Iowa should be required to take, um, which gives gives me a little bit of a pause. But um, but but they also say that you know having to learn and use these metacognitive journals has been useful for just their own their own time management, their own goal setting, and and again just being much more intentional about what they're doing in in their classes. Um, now I did, there was one question uh, that, that came up uh, that, that I missed. It was about, yeah, how, how has it impacted equity on your campus? Um, I, I, from my standpoint, I think how it has affected equity is that it's opened up the conversation about equity. It's given us a place to start talking about some of these gaps. 
like I started with, and then talking about what do we need to do to actually reduce those. Um, and one of the things that I found is, is especially when I'm presenting to faculty groups, talking about this as, fac as, as student learning can be useful because I, I think that, that all instructors want their students to learn. And so then that opens up the possibility for us to say, right, okay, that's good, but that means that, that you know, we have to support students in that learning. We can't just point the finger and, and really kind of have that fixed mindset belief that just says this is all on students and some of them will make it and some of them won't. And, and that changes the conversation. Um, and I would love to have that conversation with more of our instructors and, and get more of them to adopt, but that that then intersects with another big theme in in the the institute, which is how do we how do we reward instructors for engaging in these kinds of of activities, and 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 that's and that that's a tough nut to crack. I mean, one thing we've tried to do is to develop resources and materials to make it easy for instructors to do these things. That's still not the same as as reward. We can we can only knock down as many barriers as as, as we can with those resources. Anand, did you have something? Just some oh. great questions. Oh there. yes. All right. Uh, yeah. So question about siloing um, is uh, it, it it's really interesting. I've you know spent most of my career on uh, on on the Iowa campus and and. Uh, the the first faculty position that I had, uh, I, I was I, I was an assistant professor before being hired away, and and so didn't get engaged with as many of these issues. Um, what I've really discovered um, is is that at Iowa's campus, we we are not as siloed as I suspect many of you are. Um, I, I was at the the 2019 uh, Summer Institute. And had some really interesting conversations with folks from other other uh, universities who, who would talk about you know how they they just couldn't couldn't communicate with with other offices. And um, one of our Iowa team who was there, you know, we we were sort of reflecting on this a bit, and he sort of made the point that that we're actually really not very siloed here. Um, I think one thing that has helped has been that. Um, that on campus, we've both both Anat and I have have been on campus for a number of years, and we have a lot of personal connections in various places. Um, and that's helped open some doors that that might have been difficult otherwise if if either of us would have just sort of cold called someone to say, "Hey, can I tell you about this learning at Iowa initiative?" Um, so I think that the extent to which you can use um, some of those personal connections that that you might have that that's one way of of starting some of these conversations. Yeah, yeah, please do. Um, hopefully, y'all can hear me okay. Um, great. So, um, one of the things I mean, as the question about silos, we just spent time talking about this with our team this morning. So, um, our team is a, a number of faculty members who are already in a group together, a faculty learning community. And yet not all of them know what others are doing in their courses and what they are trying, what strategies they're using. Um, we specifically invited someone from our academic advising center who works with first year students to be able to hear what are the you know, faculty who are teaching large introductory classes and have done a lot of innovative innovations, created a lot of new metacognitive activities, what are they doing? so that the advisors can also be supporting students and following up on that. So, you know, we even spent a number of, but one of our goals is really to improve that communication on a systemic level so that we continue to do that um, as we move on, even after our grant is over. Uh, so yeah, moving moving any of the STEM faculty on the mindset spectrum. I, I think um, you know the, some some of the STEM faculty who are already partnering with with us are partnering with us because they have a growth mindset. Um, we we have another team here at the institute um, at at Iowa uh, that that is dealing with some of these issues around redesigning these large introductory STEM courses. Um, and 
I think there's work to be done there. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know the best ways to to do that. Um, it's it's also um, it's it's also just challenging work to do to have an instructor who recognizes the importance of a growth mindset, but then still will maybe slip into the language of you know needing to have a course that's rigorous. Um, or to sort of say that, well, students just aren't, you know, doing the work, and if they're not doing the work, I can't help them. Um, so I, I think our approach to this is is to try to get try try to try to have influence there by the work that we're doing and, and showing that other instructors are structuring their courses in certain ways that are useful and beneficial to students and using that as a little bit of a social influence over over others and so instead of trying to maybe change their mindset directly if we can change some of what they're doing in their courses hopefully their mindset will then also shift toward being a more growth mindset and with that answer um we have a couple minutes left before our break and I just wanted to thank Sean and Anat again for all the work that they're doing at Iowa and all the resources they shared in the chat. Thank you so much for being here and, and sharing this framework. Um, it's, it's just, as I've mentioned, I said to Sean when we first met, it's just very clear. It's very, um, it seems obvious, but it, it's also is revolutionary to maintain and sustain the focus on um, this component of what we mean by student success and that it helps students um, coming in, transi transitioning in and transitioning out of college and university. So thank you so much again.